you ready for this uh, spectacular? Um, I guess this would be the uh, what do you call it when the plot peaks? The plot peak, the climax. Well, <laughs> I think the next one will be the climax. Ah, okay, so this is just uh, this, this is just... all the awkward second arc, which all is right. like, I mean. I prefer I'm to call it. Um, mm-hmm. It's part of our. It's part of our. Uh, our our yak block. Yeah, that's what I like to call it. I'm a bit sick and low energy, and uh, perfect I'm for ca- podcasting. I, I kind of <laughs> had enough of this guy. I mean, he's interesting, but like the books about him are long, and his books are long. Everything about him is very. There's a lot of it. That's what Perhaps. she said. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Get me yak blocked. <laughs> and I mean, All it's right. interesting, but when you read it for the third time, okay, it's enough. But, well, let's okay. uh, let's introduce this thing because that was just a rousing speech there from Ray. Yeah, really <laughs> but it's interesting to, to hear more. I'll about summarize it for you, so like, you you will have a more exciting experience. Welcome to the Empire Never Ended, especially the Yaki part. This is uh, this is Boris Fritz and Ray here mm. to uh, to continue the the Yak block and uh, yeah, H E double Yaki sticks. There's a lot <laughs> to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so yeah, this is our second uh, Francis Parker Yaki episode. It won't be the last. I think we'll do at least three and plus at least two episodes on his book Imperium. So there will be a lot of yuck here. So, I mean, our first episode about him was kind of an introductory episode about his early activities. His exploits, I would call yes, them. As his a adventures. Young, as a young Nazi uh, yeah. before the Second World War and during it. That's right. Um, and a lot of his uh, intellectual um, inspirations. He had a... Uh, mm-hmm. The the non Hitlerian Nazi cool kid crew helped yeah. him build his uh, his little yeah. brain. A kind of a yeah, we saw him in develop into a kind of obnoxious, pretentious, intellectual Nazi type. I yes, guess. and a bit different from the usual American Nazis that we covered in his very European um, orientation and being quite an anti American. I guess right. It's mm-hmm. kind of the opposite of the Americanists. Yeah, yeah. Faction. But connected to all of the groups that we mentioned, especially early on, like when we covered the 30s, I mean, he he was deeply connected to all of the groups, like Father Coughlin, the German-American Bund, the American uh, First Committee, and so on. And the Silver Shirts, of course. Right. So, yeah. Um, and we'll continue, like, uh, we, we'll see how this this team even continues. Like, he, he's... Oh, sorry, guy- we forgot also... Uh- Actual Nazi intelligence agents. Yes, yes, important. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there we kind of speculated uh, that he was a part of. Uh, I mean, following, of course, that I, I continue continue to use the book by Kevin Coogan, which is called uh, "Dreamer of the Day: Francis Park Yoki and the Postwar Fascist International." And Coogan speculated that Yoki was a part of Nazi intelligence and uh, this. Uh, Operation Pastorius, it was called, which is a, right. a, a Nazi sabotage operation, which didn't work. Yeah, it was all. like their Bay of Pigs, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, spectacular um, failure. Yes. Yes. So, and we kind of left him off uh, at the end of the war uh, when, he, surprisingly, he uh, got a job uh, being a lawyer or, uh, yeah, at the war crime uh, tribunal uh, in Germany. Or right. let, let me rephrase that. The Nuremberg proceedings. Yeah. The betrayal of the German people, you mean? <laughs> the Inquisition against uh, mm-hmm. noble German warriors. So we let him off uh, last time uh, when he somewhat surprisingly got a job at the end of the war as a lawyer at the war crimes uh, um, trials that were going on uh, in Germany. Yeah, considering he was literally a diagnosed psycho and a Nazi, 
Um, and everyone knew that he was a Nazi. Yes. Like, he didn't really hide it. He talked to anyone who wanted to listen to him about him really being a Nazi. Yeah. So, when he arrived uh, to Europe, I mean, this was still, like, 45, 46, this early period, when he was in Germany. He was kind of shocked what uh, by what he saw there. So, he ho- saw the, you know, the, the Third Reich that was supposed to last for a thousand years being completely ruined and fucked up. And he didn't like that because he kind of idolized Germany. He spoke uh, mm-hmm. German and it was a Germanophile and, you know. Uh, uh, sorry, he studied in Germany, right? Mm, no, I don't think so. Oh, no, no but... sorry. I'm thinking of that Schmidt guy that was his mentor. Yeah. Yeah, never mind. Um, so he was assigned to an American war crimes group in Wiesbaden. And he worked as a civilian employee of the war department. So his job was that he was a post-trial review attorney who was evaluating uh, clemency petitions. Um, <laughs> so just rubber stamping yeah. approved. I guess. Yes. <laughs> uh, he lived in a hotel which was given uh, over to the U.S. personnel as an officer's quarters. And in his room, he installed a piano because he was a trained classical pianist. And uh, he amused himself by playing all kinds of uh, stuff, like, for example, Do- Deutschland Uber Alice and so on. <laughs> of course, his favorites. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, he found a new girlfriend there. Who It was like uh, Gisela Kuhn, uh, 24 years old. Um, yeah, I mean, we mentioned this. This guy is uh, n- not a pedophile, definitely, as you will see. Uh, <laughs> That's something we have to mention now. That, like, yes. That's a, we need he's an exception really, there. Yes, he's an exceptional yeah. case. Yes. Yeah. Although, I mean, in addition to being a Nazi, we will also see that he was also uh, an asshole. Like, yeah. A lot of, a lot of people would. Not a great partner. His, no. Already, already went through a wife, I think, at that point, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, he's still married. Yeah. Oh, is he? Mm. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so his immediate superior was a guy called uh, Samuel um, Sonnenfeld, and so Sam said this about Yoki. He said that uh, at the time, because this was the end of the war, uh, the mili- a lot of the military lawyers were being discharged and was going home. So the army was filling up these empty uh, places with civilian lawyers. Um, and he, Sam says uh, some of them were not sound as lawyers and Francis Parker Yoki was among those. No. Um, so he says that he was a very strange and uncommunicative uh, person, but my attention was quickly drawn to him. Uh, and the most notable thing about him was that he w- could never be found. So he was never <laughs> like working. Um, uh-huh. And he says, as I remember, um, what finally happened was that he was assigned to one of our uh, outlying detachments, like such as Dacha or some other, and that he just disappeared at some point. Uh, to um, the conjugal trailers of the yeah. prison Nazis. Sure. And <laughs> so he says that he probably melted into the gray area of the able soldiers and civilians who were absent from the units, but kind of scrapped some kind of a living by uh, conniving and finagling in the badly disrupted economy, mm-hmm. which was mm-hmm. a, like a big thing then. Um so there are reports. Uh, I mean, Yoki will, was monitored by all kinds of uh, uh, American agencies all the time, like civilian, military, and so on. And, and yet he got this job, which is interesting. Yes. Yeah, and disappeared. <laughs> yes. So there are reports, uh, like a lot of this information Guggen got from all kinds of reports from, you know, at the FBI, military intelligence, and so on. Uh, so there are reports that he, the Yoki was, in fact, involved in the black market. Uh, so, for example, in November of '49, uh, Army intelligence confirmed that he was connected to a known black market operator and that he was trying to obtain a new Opel uh, car. And he was also involved in the uh, the black market of like cigarettes, cigarette smuggling. So, oh. again, we have that. F- familiar we, territory we, for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, one informer also said that Yoki tried to enlist him while in Germany uh, to enlist him in, into an underground resistance movement. And apparently Yoki was searching for young Germans, preferably ex-officers who were willing to stand up against the occupation. I mean, meaning the uh-huh. American occupation, of course, um, as he referred to it. Um, so 
his most important military connection, meaning German military, like Nazi <laughs> connection, uh-huh. mm-hmm. uh, at the time was a guy called Martin Becker, uh, who was a former captain of the Luftwaffe and was an extreme like nationalist, I mean, uh, I guess a Nazi, mm-hmm. um, and uh, who actually was frequently, almost weekly, uh, traveling to the Eastern Germany, uh, officially to buy some pharmaceutical glass that he needed for his business. But that was, like, suspicious. He was always there. Um, and they even lived together for a time. Um, uh, while Yoki was talking about this resistant movement uh, uh, in the early, like, middle, like up immediately after the war in Germany, there were actually, like, Nazi acts of sabotage still going on. Hmm. So in June of 45, the U.S. military headquarters in Bremen was destroyed by an explosion. In September 45, 40 men were uh, arrested in Thuringia and accused of uh, plotting to blow up uh, military installations. Three months later, British and U.S. Um, authorities arrested 800 members of the Werewolf resistance hmm. group. So Werewolf were like basically this kind of Nazi stay behind units that uh-huh. we talked about, m- mentioned before. Yeah, uh, in many episodes, and we'll continue to do so. Um, so, but you know, for, I mm-hmm. mean, if when you play Civ, it always takes a few turns. You know, mm-hmm. when you conquer a city, yes, yeah, it'll be in disorder for a while. It'll be in disorder it's... for a while. You got to build the city hall or something, right? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so while Yoki was in Wiesbaden, for example, through two of these werewolf leaders got seven years of prison for trying to revive the. Uh, the werewolf organization in the Frankfurt area. Uh, so there was this kind of parallel world n- n- of these Nazis who were still kind of sworn, who they sw- swore an allegiance to Admiral Donitz, who was appointed by Hitler as, as his successor, right, mm-hmm. and who was in, at the time in Spandau and uh, prison and stayed there until 1955, I think. Right. Um, so he was also active in different ways at the time. So while in Wiesbaden, Yoki also wrote a, like a, a Nazi pamphlet, uh, which was called uh, Why Americans uh, Did Not Go to Berlin. And it was basically about uh, a Jewish influence uh, that di- directs the American foreign policy and so on. There was a, a, a Nazi group called Natinform. So I guess it was named after Co- Cominform, the, like basically mm-hmm. the Communist Information Bureau, but except called Natinform, which, which is sounds a Nazi like version. not... Not informed. Yes. Yes. Um, this was this organization was uh, actually formed before before the the war started, and it, already then it established cells in Latin America. It was a kind of a Nazi party propaganda apparatus, and by 1944 they transferred a lot of key important documents to Sweden, and then after the war they moved them to Latin America. And um, they uh, uh, maintain a network in Latin America and for various purposes. And these were in, like intelligence files of some sort. Or? Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, I, uh, intelligence files and files of importance to the Nazi movement that they had. Uh-huh, so, uh-huh. Um, so one of the things they would do, they uh, they um, often so. Uh, when someone uh, in the Nazi network after the war wanted to publish some kind of a, a Nazi text, uh, usually these manuscripts were sent to, to this group in Argentina. Then they would be published there in German and then smuggled back into Germany and mm-hmm. other European mm-hmm. countries. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, they started a publishing house in Argentina, which was called Dürer Verlag, and published also a magazine which was called uh, Der Weg. Um, and uh, Yoki would publish his text in that magazine, as many other Nazis did at the time. But he had this like close connection to actual Nazis um, and who were orga- already started organizing these networks, even not only like during the war or after it, but even before the war started, they already had these uh, networks abroad. Mm-hmm. Um, Again, so all while- under the watchful eye of multiple um, intelligence agencies from the U.S., yes. etc. Um so while this was going on, his uh, marriage was crumbling. Uh, so his wife, Alice Yoki, m- and uh, their two daughters, uh, Isolde and Brunhilde, also known as Loli and Bruni, uh, moved uh, to Germany in 1946 in an attempt mm. to, to somehow save their marriage. 
people who met them at the time said that she was like completely kind of um, dominated by him and that he would dominate anyone who would allow him to do that. Uh-huh. That kind of guy, an yeah, asshole. Pierce type. Um, and um, so some accounts say that he deserted the family in 1946 and disappeared and that she returned to Texas in 1947. Her maid, on the other hand, says that actually she dumped Yoki. Uh, and then on more than one occasion, this woman saw Yoki crying uh, because uh, uh, Alice didn't allow him to um, see their daughters because she, she kicked him out of the house. Mm. Uh, yeah. But he did manage to get uh, Alice's money because she had some inheritance and then she, uh, he made her buy some citrus farm in the US and then also um, he conv- convinced Alice to sign this property over to him. And this was also not only a farm, it was some kind of a business. Uh, so he was getting some money out of that. Yeah. This like motherfucker. Yaki, Yaki brand orange juice or something. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. This motherfucker in his stupid ass book Imperium is all about how the materialistic, economic minded ways need to, you know, be defeated under the, the spiritual truth of the, the being. But this man like came from money. Yeah. Then like, uh, like, he's all about money, isn't he? He went and did some black market scams, fucking smuggled cigarettes. He's making yeah. money. He has money. And he goes and he takes his wife's money and then her business. Yes. Yes. And then she <laughs> tra- she tried, she used some lawyers to try, to, uh, try to get back that, like, claim that he got it by fraud and so on. But I don't know what was in the end happened there, but he had some money from that. Um, well, I w- I'm sure what happened is he tried to represent himself and lost. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In November of forty six, Yoki was officially fired finally because he didn't just he didn't show up at work, and not because he wasn't like a psychotic Nazi, right? Or, or, or like deeply involved in Nazi network, global yeah, yeah. Nazi networks. But he no, no, didn't... Henry Ford literally fired somebody for being too much of a Nazi, for its cool. <laughs> yes, yeah. um, but he was fired <laughs> yes. because he did not show up at work, right? <laughs> um, for I guess years, or, or at least a year. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, after six months you know we were ready to give him a fifth chance but after yeah. a year what can you do so in november uh, in december of 46 he showed up uh, in an american consulate in zurich where he lived at the time and got one year and a, a year uh, extension to his passport great um so he traveled to europe and then he returned to the U.S. Um, he stayed with his sister Winnette and her husband William Coyne. We mentioned them before. This is the guy who was working in, in naval, naval intelligence at the time. Uh-huh, so right. he stayed with them in Illinois for, I think, five months. Um, and he would send food packages to his German girlfriend at the time. So I guess he oh. was not a complete asshole, I guess. Had some compassion to this poor woman. Sent her food. <laughs> well, he didn't want his only fucking pen pal to starve to death i guess um and in the fall of 1947 he moved to ireland uh to write imperium that Mm -hmm. was his whole plan uh and so he also wrote a kind of a pledge at the time i'm gonna read it now oh good a pledge oh it's been a little pledges and oaths (laughs) yeah what are we joining now um i think he's not joining anything um what's the point of a personal pledge maybe uh, you will see it is modeled actually interestingly uh it is modeled after the brothers karamazov uh, novel oh, okay. and um, not what i expected yeah. there's a like a, a pledge there um by ivan karamazov so he kind of stole that and changed the text a little bit okay so this is what he says I will go from one end to the other of my beloved Europe. I know well that I shall be going only to a churchyard, but I know too that the churchyard is dear, very dear to me. Beloved dead lie buried there. Every stone over them, every bomb crater containing the pulverized bones of these dead tells of a life once so ardently lived, so passionate a belief in its own achievements, its own truth, its own battles, its own knowledge that I know even now I know that I shall fall down and kiss these stones, these endless ruins, this blood-drenched sacred earth, and weep. But I surely also know that then, despite a convulsive rage at the perpetrators of this crime, I will again stand erect over this European graveyard and swear to solemn 
uh, swear the solemn oath that to my last breath I will fight tooth and nail against those who attempted, in vain to be sure, to destroy the cradle of our Western culture with its unmatched accomplishments, with its deeds unique in the annals of humanity. This I, Francis Yoki, do solemnly swear. I mean, really long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Mm. So Very he's, romantic there. He's in uh, the wreckage of Europe with a boner and yes. <laughs> wants to make out with rocks. Uh, yeah, yes, that's what I got from him. Yeah. You know, I mean, mushrooms are a great drug. I'm not going to knock them. Mm -hmm. You don't got to make a pledge out of it. So on his birthday, which is September uh, 18th, uh, in 1947, he arrived to Dublin, Ireland and immediately went to Britas Bay, which is like a nice uh, little town on the coast there. Uh, and he wrote Imperium there. Apparently he didn't have some, at, the, at that time, local connections with the Nazis and so on. So he, he went there just because it was a remote place that he liked and could use the time to write. Um, he maintained contact with Gisela Kuhn in uh, Germany and also was in all kinds of like deals, financial at the time, I guess, using his wife's money. So he wrote I to her... I think you mean spiritual, spiritual deals. Yes, spiritual business mm -hmm. deals, yes. Thank you. He, he wrote to her and instructed her to buy a plot of land in her name in the vicinity of Hitler's retreat. Um, <laughs> and he also... They love this. only got to go yeah. up, baby. <laughs> 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 he also <laughs> instructed her to meet some uh, guy called Bruno Buchner um, and who will provide her with the money, but the deal didn't work out. Uh, so he, he, I think in the end didn't buy this plot of land. Um, while we, uh, while living in Ireland and writing Imperium, which was still not written, he visited England in the autumn of '47 uh, to meet Oswald Mosley, the leader of mm. the pre-war British Union on, of fascists, who was interned, I think, during the war as a as a yeah. fascist, as a black shirt, and a kind of imitator of both Hitler and Mussolini, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, Why so he made fun of? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mosley came back to politics already in '46 when uh, he published a book called My Answer, which was a kind of a, his uh, defense of himself as not being, uh, I guess, a traitor. Yeah, he was trying to say. Um, and next year in '47, he published his own Imperium, basically, that kind of a book, which was called The Alternative. And it had a similar message to, to Yoki's book. He uh, advocated for giving up the the old narrow nationalism, which he thought was obsolete, and um, that a new united Europe must be created now as a third force between the USSR and uh, America. Mm -hmm. um, so Mosley had a lot of fans, you know, uh, and groups started, like fashy groups started uh, forming around him. Um, and during this period, the first meeting between Yoki and uh, Mosley happened. Um, sh this was shortly before the the official founding of Mosley's Union Movement. So the Union Movement was his post Second World War political organization. Um, so he met these people, these British fascists, in the aut first for the first time in the autumn of uh, forty seven in some fascist bookstore in Britain. Um, and the ones who met him at the time described him as a kind of a bohemian type, at least in the opinion of a British fascist in 1947. <laughs> this uh, he wore shorts once. Yes. <laughs> yes. So they described him as being like five feet, seven inches tall, slim, but wiry built, mm. uh, with dark brown hair and eyes and a pale complexion. Um, so the guy, the two guys that he met... Does in, not sound like a healthy guy. No. I mean, he's all often described as not looking healthy. Look, when um, the British tell you you're pale. Yeah, that's... Yeah, right. you know. So, uh, he, the two guys that he met, like, who were close collaborators of Mo Mosley and who would become important for Yoki later on were uh, guys called uh, Guy Chesham and um, John Gannon. They were, like, Mosley uh, collaborators, but soon they will become Yoki collaborators. Mm -hmm. Um... Some sources even say that Yoki basically became a member of the union moment, uh, movement and also like a paid member, uh, a part of their organizing staff, which was in uh, in charge of uh, their European connections. Uh, so that was, I guess, his field. Do you know uh, if Mosley was familiar with Yaki before that or was the meeting kind of more initiated by Yaki? I think it was initiated by him from 
what I understand. He was the kind of a Mosley fan, I think. Right. And also, he expected help from him in publishing uh, the book that he was <laughs> just writing. Um, because Mosley was known like as a fascist, but also now had this like very pro-European politics, and that was completely in tune with what Imperium was about. Or so Yoki thought, but he will be surprised. Um, so in '48 he finished Imperium and returned to England from Ireland. Um, he lived in London uh, and continued. Uh, the, this whole time he is continuing his secret campaign against the War Crimes Tribunal. Um, and apparently, uh, while in Wiesbaden, he uh, so this job was useful for this because um, he could get some legal files and then he turned it over to the Nazi underground. This was sure. already yeah, when that. he was uh, in Germany. Um, this is something that he also he had. Uh, this this is also one thing that connected him to Mosley because Mosley was very early, like uh, openly critical of the Nuremberg trials and he uh, saw them as an attempt to seek vengeance against the whole uh, nation, uh, which he thought was very unjust. Um, <laughs> right by individually yeah. trying individuals for individual yes. crimes. Yes. yes. So, for example, at the time. So one, later, actually, one French fascist and a literary critic, um, some Maurice Berdesh or something like this, I'm not sure how this, the name is pronounced, um, he wrote in 1993 that Yoki has sent some documents to him uh, uh, in these like early like post-war years, and uh, these were documents that were to be used in defense of accused war criminals. Um, for example, some SS general Otto Ollendorf, for example, who was a commander of an Einsatz, uh, Einsatz, Einsatz, Einsatz? It's Einsatzgruppen. Okay. That was Einsatz yeah. also. Yeah. Uh, a commander of an Einsatzgruppen in uh, in Ukraine. The, uh, this guy was actually responsible for uh, uh, killing ninety thousand people, mm -hmm. and um, so Yoki was directly like trying to help him. Well, of course, lovely. Yes. Um, Mosley also uh, believed that uh, the Waffen SS veterans uh, were the natural leaders of a new uh, post Hitlerian fascist movement because he saw them as being like free of this, you know, narrow nationalism. Because I guess through their experience of being a part of an international Nazi military, uh, they became advocates in his view, mind of some kind of a, a European, almost federalist. Nazi movement or something like this. I'd say it's a very generous summation of the SS. I mean, he kind of really believed the yeah. the ide ideology behind kind of the SS then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As yeah. the kind of, yeah, like ideological army. Yes. Mm. Yoki was also a part uh, of the defense of the SS uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Fritz. Uh, <gasps> yes, another Fritz. God Fritz damn it. Knochlen, uh, I guess. Um and also find uh, found uh, like a, a very uh, well regarded English lawyer for this Nazi. Uh, the lawyer was actually a Labour member of the House of Commons at the time. Um, hmm. So it is even possible that these kind of acti activities was also the first reason why uh, Yoki was even introduced to Mosley because they were mm -hmm. both mm -hmm. active in this type of stuff, trying to help. Nazi war criminals. Um, by the way, the Nazi that they tried to help was hanged. They didn't manage to help. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Imperium was first published in London in 1948. Um, and it, the whole point of the book, I mean, we'll have episodes about it. I won't go too much into it. Is to try... No spoilers there. Yeah. Come on. It's an attempt to imagine fascism, you know, after Hitler. So it was kind of well received by fascists because they were like, it was 1948, they needed a new vision of fascism. And this is like one of the attempts to provide it. Um, he, he was, he, the text was similar to Mosley's, as we mentioned, because uh, Yoki thought that in the future, no European, like old fashioned nation states won't uh, exist anymore. And uh, the, the idea of a united U Europe will be dominated. When the book was published, he sent copies of it to fascist leaders around the world. Uh, it was well received by many prominent Nazis in Germany, like Hans Ulrich uh, uh, Rudel, who was uh, mm -hmm. and um, Luftwaffe, who and he praised the the book in Italy. It was also well received. 
received. In Italy, it was also well received. For example, by um, Giorgio Almirante, who was the leader of the MSI, the mo Italian Social Movement, which was the main uh, neo-fascist uh, party in um, Italy, mm -hmm. uh, but also by Giulio Sevola, the kind of intellectual mm -hmm. leader of neo-fascism there that we mentioned many times and we'll continue, like probably we'll have at least a few episodes just about him. And also by a fascist uh, called uh, uh, Princess Pignatelli, Uh, she was a leader <laughs> sure. of the kind of the female division of the MSI uh, party. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Good Lord. Yeah. She was an actual princess? Uh... I guess so. I don't know. I mean, uh, for example, Julius Evola called himself a baron and he was not a baron. Okay. Uh, he came from a bourgeois family, like of some clerks or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I don't think Il Duce was a duke either. So. <laughs> yes. yeah. um, but I guess this one was a princess. I don't know. Uh, so the book was distributed to major universities. For example, it, the first edition is in the library of the House of Commons as well. Mm. Uh, so it was like read. Um, and one person who was enthusiastic about it was the, uh, the British retired Major General J.F.C. Fuller, who was a fascist, a non-fascist. Mm -hmm. um, and he called the book the most prophet prophetic book since the decline of the West by Spengler. Um, well, we'll see. Yes. On Friday. So at the time, the, the Italian um, uh, uh, MSI, uh, the Italian uh, social movement, was one of the groups that was trying to reorganize fascism as a kind of a European movement. So, for example, in 1950, uh, MSI organized um, a meeting in Rome to discuss the future of Europe. And M Mosley was one of the fascists who attended that. Um, they continue to organize such meetings, and this is now an interesting period in you know the history of fascism because this was the this is the start of neo-fascism, but also right. a lot of old Nazis and fascists are part of this revival. So we have you know new fascists and old ones uh, meeting together, and so in one of these meetings, European fascist meetings organized by MSI, like a former leader of the Hitler Jugend is there and he speaks about uh, also about Europe as a, as a kind of a third force in global geopolitics mm -hmm. um, against Bolshevik control but also against the colonization of uh, by the US right. um, in 1951 uh, they organize a, a conference in Malmo in Sweden and the European social movement is formed which is the fascist international Uh, also called the, the Malmo International. Mm -hmm. So the Italian group is really kind of the, 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 the leading force in, in these attempts at the time. Um, but uh, Yoki was shocked when uh, Mosley kind of rejected him. He was not very interested in, in Yoki mm -hmm. or in his book or any of Aww. his ideas, uh, which was very disappointing for him because he was strongly counting on him as his uh, ally in publishing uh, this book. <laughs> Is this just the British exceptionalism, just in general? Like, you know, they always want to do something different than the rest of Europe? <laughs> yes. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And they're fascists. Like. Yeah. I, I yeah. can just picture Yaki after this going back to this fucking room, you know, like playing some piano sadly and then trying to call his wife, but she won't pick up. So he has to call his fucking mistress who just wants food, you know, and like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. <laughs> Yes, it's not. He's great. nailing it out there. I mean, he, this like whole period. I mean, you will see. Like, it's um, he's. I think he's in some kind of permanent crisis situation. Um, so uh, when he wanted to see Mosley, he basically uh, needed to beg for Mosley to receive him. Uh, then Mosley, in, in the end, did receive him, but was kind of cold towards Yoki. Yoki left, this was before the book was even published, he left the manuscript with him and then begged Mosley to read it. And he see, uh, saw him a few days later and realized that Yoki, uh, that Mosley maybe just took like a, like a glance at it. No it, shit, it, it's 700 fucking pages, dude. Yes, I mean, <laughs> of course. Um, and uh, at, so Mosley was obviously not interested at all, but then Yoki proceeded at this meeting to... Be, suggest that he would be even ready to renounce all of uh, his rights to the manuscript and that he would be willing if Mosley published it as his own book, which I don't know why he suggested that because Mosley was obviously not even interested to read it. And not, It's not... just emotional blackmail. Yeah. <laughs> Very um, sad, sad Nazi. 
Yeah, but so Mosley refused him, of course, um, and then like proceeded to treat him with disdain and irony. And people who were there said that he, not for a moment ever he took uh, Yaki seriously. Yeah, Mosley mm. would walk into a room, pick up a piano, and then play Yaki's style of piano playing for all the guests, you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I'm Francis Parker Yaki. Amadeus. <laughs> 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 mm. And not only that, but uh, Mosley even like uh block uh, uh the review the publication of a review of uh, uh Yoki's book in, the, <laughs> in his newspaper he is just harsh fucking with him yes. yeah he previously like promised that a review will be like published and then he just decided no we won't do that we'll just, just ignore it wants to ruin a nerd's life you know yeah but um Maybe the, this thing was crucial because Yoki had some fans, as I mentioned, those two guys, Guy Chasm and this other guy, John Gannon, uh, mm-hmm. among Mosley's crew. So Sorry, is that people, John Gammon? Gannon, I guess. Oh, that's too bad. So uh, they, I think maybe this was a, a turning point, uh, but this rejection of Yoki led uh, them to finally leave Mosley mm-hmm. um, and join Yoki, basically. So uh, I. Okay. So uh, let me see if there's something maybe interesting to read here from the book about this. I mean, what's funny about that is that if, like, Mosley had some convincing reasons to give for fucking with Yoki, probably, you know, he could have kept these people, but he was just outright bullying him for fun, I think. Yeah, was it even, like, an ideological objection to Yaki particularly, or just, like... I think it's too many fears in the kitchen, you know? Yeah, that's what I'm... That's what I think. Yeah, I'll, I, there is. I will mention it soon, but... so. So this guy, Chesham, when he resigned and left Mosley, he wrote uh, something to Mosley and he said, uh, among other things to him, um, with this book you acquired a heaven-sent opportunity to supply your group with a granite-like ideology. Damn. Blah, 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 blah. You hated Imperium because it was a summons to action, because it demanded a shattering of illusion and a manly facing of political facts. Look, I'm only... I'm only 300 pages into it, but I haven't gotten to that part yet, so I can't verify. <laughs> so I guess a lot of these fascists saw um, Mosley as a kind of a passive guy who was not a man of action, and Yoki apparently was. So they thought th- this was like uh, one of the reasons why Yoki was rejected. But um, I think the other, I mean, the more important reason was that although Mosley talked about uh, Europe as a third force, he really kind of accepted the American dominance of uh, uh, Europe and perf- much preferred it to the alternative or, mm. of the Soviet domination of Europe. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Yoki, of course, went into a completely opposite direction. So mm-hmm. uh, Yoki was more and more turning towards the East. And while uh, he was going through this process, he lived with his new lover, uh, with in in London, which was a Baroness Alice von Flügel. Um, was she though? <laughs> was she, she was. <laughs> I'm really suspicious now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, every time Ray reads a German name, I love. It. <laughs> <laughs> I just love how everybody's a fucking Baron or Princess. Yes. Or so dude. I mean, uh, they lived in her mansion in uh, London, which some people say was a crown property. So maybe mm. she was a Baroness. I don't know. All right. Uh, she was a mysterious older woman, um, and they All became right. lo- lovers in 1948. All right. Uh, so when Mosley rejected him, she became the financier of uh, the publication of Imperium, um, huh. and apparently she was she was very <laughs> pro-Soviet for some reason, and uh, had this kind of an influence. <laughs> Who is this woman? It's like Baroness. <laughs> yes. It's like in a, in a old mansion in London, but pro-Soviet. Somehow. A German pro-Soviet <laughs> Baroness in London. <laughs> Yes, okay. Um, uh, also a Nazi. Um, yeah, sure. So this is when, while living with her, he really kind of started this uh, uh, open uh, ad- advocacy for the fascist uh, cooperation with the Soviet Union. Um, and this is when he was getting close to these two British guys, former cooperators of Mosley, and they started planning the three of them, or maybe at that point, the four of them. Uh, starting, uh, they started planning uh, uh, their new group. 
mm-hmm. uh, based on this Yoki ideology. Um, and the group sh- will be called the European Liberation Front, ELF. Um, <laughs> hmm. So, um, during this period, uh, they were approached by agent, Nazi agents of a group which was called Natinform. Now, to make things uh, more uh, confusing, that's not the same Natinform as the one mentioned before. There's two? Okay. That's yes. what happens when you're not informed. Yes. Th- this not inform was uh, some like neo-Nazi uh, British-German uh, group. That neo-Nazi inform. Yes. This, that Nazi not inform and neo-Nazi not inform. <laughs> so these people were approached by two agents of this group who, who were kind of suspicious of these people advocating, you know, cooperation with Soviet Union. So there was like one British um, Nazi called uh, John Gaston, I guess, or Gaston, I don't know. Um, and his German girlfriend, uh, Elisabeth Schnitzler. <laughs> and, um, so they approached these people and uh, he basically took a lot of information on them that they used to discredit them in the international Nazi movement. So mm. because when they talked to Yoki, Yoki, for example, told them how Mosley's union movement is the instrument of U.S. policy, um, he said things uh, praising the Soviet policy in East Germany. He then asked them to help him in organizing secret partisans in West Germany who would cooperate with the Soviets against the Western oc- occupation. It's unusual for a Nazi, not going to yes. lie. Yeah. He also told them that, I mean, this is what they say. He told them that if they as- accept, they would be initiated by him in a vast and worldwide secret organization which is working to establish an authoritarian state, which he called real national socialism, and that millions of people are somehow involved in this secret organization, and that he, Yoki, is a representative of uh, the organization's secret leader, who he will not name. Okay, yeah, to- totally yeah, not real. It doesn't exist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, um, so they also met these other guys. So in 1950, they met with this Chesson guy, um, and he outlined a plan uh, uh, to them of infiltration of all nationalist groups. And the aim would be to direct them into a like violently anti-American uh, direction. Um, and I guess to discredit them, these Nazis said that how uh, these Yoki people said that how at first, in the early stages, they won't be open anti-Semites, which I guess was something that uh-huh. uh, was used to discredit them. Um so they had plans uh, of raising forces in the UK that would uh, uh, be used against American military bases there. Um, and they said, if we organize successfully an anti-American uh, front with a popular support, it would become possible to obtain financial support from the USSR. But I mean, what what is it specifically that he finds more appealing in the USSR ideologically than in the u.s yeah i think maybe fritz could tell uh, this something about this in one of the imperium episodes but okay uh basically i mean it's very interesting because every time when they praise ussr it sounds like they're not because uh they uh, they when they talk about russia they say how russia is a primitive asiatic yes. Oh, uh, yeah. country it's all fucking barbarians in yes um uh, and he has a completely different soul from the West and so on, but, but uh, this is also why they cannot be manipulated by the Jews and how Stalinism is a kind of a, a primitive Russian nationalist response to the Jewish control and the rejection of it and so on. And, but but yeah. then what happened to Judeo-Bolshevism? Uh, and the, the whole like point of That's Nazism. Trotskyism. <laughs> Trotskyism is the Western Jewish uh, communism and Stalinism is the primitive uh-huh. Russian anti-Semitic communism, which Despite is Despite the fact that he's Georgian. Yes. Uh, so uh, so they, sometimes they go into different directions. One is that uh, the, uh, the dominance of that kind of Russia or Europe will kind of wake up Europe, but it also it, it will not ideologically colonize it as the Jewish Americans will and mm-hmm. completely subvert it. And in fact, we'll have some kind of a positive reaction against that kind of Soviet domination in Europe. So this is a good thing. But you know, other times they actually talk about an actual alliance with Russia. So, uh, but there is a chapter about that, I think, in Imperium. So I think maybe Fritz will... 
So this it, it so. seems like they kind of yeah think that the Soviets then are like brutish, but can be easily duped by yes. like smart and they, Nazis to it, to counter the actual main threat in the U.S. And, yes, and they think that you know America is like a dangerous. Um, colonizing uh, force who completely ideologically subverts Europe and its identity. Uh, mm -hmm. But Russia is not. Uh, they see Stalinism basically as a Russian rejection of Jewish control. And they don't see like uh, a direct ideological uh, danger in Russia, I think. There's also a Sh Spenglerian kind mm. of uh, justification as well with Russia specifically, which is that mm -hmm. um, Russia was seen to have not yet entered its civilizational phase. And mm -hmm. so it was seen as like mm -hmm. an up and coming civilization. So it would be expected that for now, you know, these are the barbarians, but they're going to start building pretty things soon. Voila. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So while talking to these uh, Nazi agents, uh, these Yoki people also say how a s similar organization to theirs is being set up in Germany and that Yoki is somehow part of that operation as well. They also say to them, according to Nazi agents, how Hitler and Rosenberg really distorted the real national socialism and that real national socialism should be based on Spengler and um, Müller van der Broek. I mean, that's something that we mentioned, their influence mm -hmm. on Yoki in the first episode. I mean, I don't know if this is completely authentic, what these Nazis say. They use this to discredit the Yoki group, but I mean, certainly is something close to what they were saying. Although officially they maintained like a pro-Hitler stance, I mean, for sure. So, I mean, uh, Imperium is dedicated to Hitler, who is yes. called the, the hero of the Second World War, I think. Or something. Right. Um, so at the time, uh, Yoki broke up his uh, uh, relationship with the mysterious Baroness, and uh, him and his two uh, English buddies launched their group, European, European Liberation Front, in the early 1949. Although... It, so they immediately published their kind of manifesto, which Yoki wrote, which is a summary of uh, Imperium, which is called the Proclamation of London. But so they he should have given that to Mosley. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, but they backdated it to 1948, although they mm. published it in 1949 because they wanted to um, commemorate the 100 years since the publication of the Communist Manifesto. I Interesting. See. Yeah. Um, and also, it's called the Proclamation of London, but it's it was uh, written in the flat of one of the English guys in Manchester. So it's a uh, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> sounds less impressive. Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, it is. Said <laughs> it would that, just be fucking socialist if it was <laughs> the Proclamation yeah. of Manchester. Um, so it is said that the ELF at its height had like 150 supporters. Uh, the main task, as they saw it, of their group was the production of anti-American propaganda. Uh, it published a monthly uh, like zine, which was called Front Fighter. Uh, they published this uh, from 1950 to 1954 in approximately 500 copies. They had an extensive mailing list, so they would send this across the world to many Nazis. Uh, they also had some public meetings in London and Manchester. Um, but the most important thing they published was this uh, manifesto written by Yoki. Um, and in it, they also listed 12 uh, demands by their organization. Among them is the liberation of Britain and Europe from the reign of the inner traitor and the outer enemy, the integration of liberated Britain into sovereign European people-nation-state, immediate expulsion of all Jews and other parasitic aliens from the soil of Europe, uh, and establishment of the organic state. Thought they um, were laying low on the anti-Semitism in the yes, beginning. Yes, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Couldn't hold it <laughs> in. Yeah. This is Just laying expulsion, low. I guess, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me see if there is a quote here that could be read. We'll be back with more Yacht Talk with the Schlock. The schlock. Yacht Talk with the Schlock does work. Mm-hmm. With the Schlock. <laughs> no, I don't need to read this. Um, <laughs> some anti-Semitic shit. <laughs> yeah, fine. You get the idea. Yeah, something, yeah. something, something. Jews. Something, something, something. Marx yeah, probably. Control, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know. You know. It. Uh -huh. It's always baseball the same. shoes. <clears throat> yes. Yada yada. I mean, uh, anti-Semitic and anti-American. That's the point for oh, okay. these guys. As opposed to anti-Semitic and anti-Soviet, which is what we usually see in yes. Nazi yeah, texts. Yes. So okay. So, very unique mm -hmm. there. Okay. Wait. So is Roosevelt controlled by the Bolsheviks or not? I don't know. 
I mean, uh, remember that one of his like mentors that we mentioned in the first episode was this like pro Roosevelt uh, yes. fascist who thought that uh, that Roosevelt was like abandoning the more radical aspects of the New Deal. Yeah, so, yeah Coughlin's buddy, right? Union yeah. Party guy. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Yes. So I don't know. Um, so Yoki was not alone in this pro-Soviet uh, orientation uh, uh, by the fascists at the time. So around the time that uh, they published these texts, a new Nazi or neo-Nazi or, or both actually uh, party was founded in Germany, which was the Socialist Reich Party. I mean, this is a party mm-hmm. which was find, founded by uh, ex-Nazis. I mean, uh-huh. yeah. Um, well, I mean, might makes right, you know? Yes. They kicked your ass. <laughs> You gotta love them. So the so- the Socialist Reich Party also had a call for like a pro-Eastern neutralist uh, Germany, uh, which was also almost identical to Yoki. Um, and in a way, like it was, I mean, in contact with <laughs> Yoki and his group. What is what does it mean to be pro something neutralist? I guess to be a protectorate, maybe. Like I think it's I think it's a way to like. Say that you're neutral, but in reality have a kind of prefer one of the options. Like similar, like, you know, Mosley was like, uh, in that sense, a pro-Western neutralist. Like he would uh-huh. say that he wants Europe as a bloc, but he obviously prefers America to the Soviet Union. And with these people, right. it was kind of yeah. a reverse position. I'd imagine that the model that they're kind of looking at is some of the like neutral, well, you know, like Spain or Portugal during World War II. Mm, right, mm. which were like fascist, but yeah. neutral, not participating, but would kind of have the protection and yes. cooperation with Germany. So they're probably looking to do something like that with the Soviet Union, which is like, okay, we're going to do our own thing, but like, you know, we support you and, you know, yeah, officially we're against the not, Americans too. Officially whatever. not a part of the Soviet sphere, but actively working against American influence, I guess, with the help of the Soviets, probably what they had in mind. Neutralish, right. yes, yeah. Mm, so, uh, was Yoki a stressor, stressorist? I mean, so or stressorite? I don't know how you say it. So, uh, uh, when we mentioned stressorite, I think it's stressorite. Yeah, stressorite. I, I yeah. stressorite. Yeah. I mean, I think it was, this book is the, you, the term is stressorist, but I don't know. So, so many I mean, this term uh, refers to the brothers Gregor and Otto Strasser, mm-hmm. who were the uh, members of the so-called left wing or the leaders of the so-called left wing of the Nazi party. Right, yeah. Um, wh- who apparently took the socialist part of their name a little bit ser- more seriously, at least in uh, to criticize Hitler as abandoning their like kind of anti-capitalist stance and selling the party to uh, financiers and so on. So Gregor uh, was a leader of, of of the Nazi party in the north of Germany, and he remained a member of the Nazi party until he was murdered in the Night of the Long Knives. And mm-hmm. his brother Nazi Otto, on Nazi violence. his brother Otto, unlike Gregor, uh, openly broke with the party and formed his own group, group which was called the. I think the Union of Revolutionary National Socialists or something like this, but was most commonly called the Black Front. Um, um, and I think bef- uh, when uh, the Nazi party came to power, he went uh, into exile. Um, so um, Yoki and his group were certainly denounced by some Nazis as stress rights. So one of the people who called them that was the British fascist uh, Arnold Lees. We mentioned him, I think, in our first episode. Yeah, I remember uh, Lees, yeah. Because he was a mentor of Colin Jordan. He, yes. he was a, a British fascist who was, like, more extreme than Mosley and thought that, you know, Mosley was, a, like, a propagator of kosher fascism or something like this. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. this is the guy who called uh, Yoki a stress, right? And also another guy who we know well, well it was George Lincoln Rockwell who was kind oh. of mm-hmm. appalled by Yoki's pro-Soviet stance. He'd um, be appalled by anything more than a couple hundred pages, though, to be fair. No, yeah. But also, it's a very <laughs> strange, um, I would say, accusation, though, just considering Imperium, because uh, it's just very, obviously, an elitist text. Like, it's... Yes. it's uh, well, th- th- this is something that, I mean, I think I mentioned this before, how a lot of, I mean, fascism is not really a coherent ideology or a movement in any way but a lot of these people who have some kind of um, uh, who try to have a more 
let's say, creative or a dissident voice inside of a movement tend to go into opposite directions and then somehow mix them up. So one would be this more kind of Spenglerian or Evolian aristocratic uh, reactionary, like more right-wing than fascism point of view. And yeah. the other is this, like, no, we are actually uh, socialist and Hitler betrayed socialism and we are a proletarian movement and so on, which are kind yeah. of opposite ways to criticize uh, the mainstream fascist movement, but somehow uh, they find each other in this contradictory way, uh, often in the same organizations. You have the ones who think that, you know, Hitler was too plebeian and the one who thinks that he betrayed the proletariat, or at least but say that. They all right. blame the Jews and that keeps them yeah. a family. So, um, Yoki, it seems it had no direct connection to the, the Strasser movement, but uh, it could be called in some wider sense that, in uh, Kugan's opinion, because it had this uh, pro-Soviet foreign policy, which was also characteristic for Strasser's uh, organization, and they supposedly also rejected this kind of biological determinism in their racism, although I really don't see any difference in their racist practice. Only they say, okay, it's not based in bio, bio, biology, but I mean... Yeah, we'll, we'll talk mean, about what it's based in, hopefully. Yeah, it doesn't, uh, doesn't mean they're less yeah. racist. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, Yoki did maintain uh, a relationship with an ex-member of the Black Front, which was called... Alfred Franke uh, Griech. So this guy was a close collaborator of Otto Strasser and went with him into exile, uh, but then had a change, changed his mind and made a deal with Himmler and became a, a, an officer in the Waffen SS, returned mm. to Germany and became the officer in the Waffen SS. His son would say how he had some kind of an understanding with Himmler, who was his old friend, and they agreed supposedly how Hitler, you know, betrayed the movement and um, mm. how he, under false name, uh, rejoined uh, the uh, Waffen SS and so on. But it, I mean, it's pretty obvious that the opposite is true, that he betrayed. Uh, Strasser, um, and that because after him uh, joining, rejoining the mainstream Nazi movement in the Waffen SS, the Nazi state kind of really uh, destroyed the remnants of the Black Front in Germany and their underground mm -hmm. movement there, obviously because they were informed on their activities by this guy. Um, so, wait, this dude's son remained kind of a supporter ideologically? I think so. Of the I mean, Black he's Front? quoted in this book, but I'm, yeah. Maybe he just tried to. Um, maybe he believed that his father, like, was not a, did not. Maybe he did not want to believe that his father, you know, betrayed uh, his friends that got them killed by the right. SS. Or after the war, he was like, "Well, my dad was against Hitler too." Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, yes. So, um, so this guy Griech, uh, the uh, former Strasserite, then Waffen SS guy. Uh, in the Waffen SS, he was like an intelligence officer, and uh, so he he was an um, intelligence officer in the. Uh, let me see. Where did I write this? It's on page fifty-three. You totally just made that number up, didn't you? Yeah, it's, I mean it's his notes. <laughs> I assume there's at least sixty. So. So, Greek was actually an intelligence officer in the SS, in the Totenkopf uh, division. Um, and later, he was an officer in the main office of the SD, the, the, the intelligence of the SS, which makes it even less probable that he was, you know, being like, a, a, like an important intelligence officer under an assumed name and then no, not knowing who he is and so on. I mean, it doesn't make yeah, any sense. No. Um, so, he... Uh, had a connection with Yoki after a war, uh, the war because he established an organization uh, which was called Bruderschaft or, or Brotherhood in Germany. And this was a kind of a fascist elite group connected to Nazi groups around the world. Um, and apparently he had a critical role in the Nazi underground railroad that smuggled war criminals to South America and the Middle East. Um, and the uh, Bruderschaft in the 1950s even tried to form a paramilitary group in Germany, which was called uh, Freikorps Deutschland. Um, but in the end of the war, when he was still the intelligence officer, he already started planning 
uh, uh, these kind of activities. And he made a blueprint for a post-war fascist Europe, which he called the German Freedom Movement. Um, and this called for the establishment of a kind of a federal, basically almost a kind of a federal fascist Europe, which won't, wouldn't be openly dominated by Germany, uh, but a kind of a, I don't know, some kind of a fascist federal system or something like this. I don't know. Like a fascist EU that yes. Germany definitely doesn't dominate. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, so it is said that some kind of similar ideas uh, it did exist in the Waffen SS, and this is you know why Mosley had high hopes for these people as the leaders of the future European fascist movement and so on. So it seems that you know his group Bruderschaft that Yoki was connected to came out of these ideas that he even developed you know while the war was still going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so the plan of this secret group was to slowly recapture power through basically infiltration into the government, but also like various parties. And they had various plans to take over, I think, for example, the Liberal Party in Germany and so on, which was found out, I think, at some point. Um, but he also saw this group as an, an elitist group. Uh, he, he thought that the age of mass movements is uh, over. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the, the way to go forward is to have all elitist groups and, you know, infiltration. We see this a lot with so. these fascist groups. They get easily discouraged. And... Well, no, it's like when nobody likes them, they're like, oh, the age of mass movements is over. I mean, that's yeah, what it is. Yeah. I didn't want to sit at your table anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, Yoki was really connected to a lot of these important Nazi people at the time uh, and had... Uh, an open pro-Soviet uh, orientation. So I don't know what's going on here, really. I am not completely sure. Like, is this a genuine thing or not? I cannot say. Um, it is evident that he was under the surveillance of uh, American intelligence. They tried to kind of find out more about him. Uh, did they generally were they generally not able to arrest him or not? I don't know. I mean, he had many passports and identities, always used, who used fake, fake names and so on. So uh, it's a very strange story, uh, as we'll see. It continues in a strange direction. Ray, this is a very strange episode, actually, in the end. Uh, it's uh, kind of not as much about y- Yaki as much about his world, which is actually oh. uh, really building this guy's like character, I have to say. I mean, you know a man from his friends. Yeah, yes, that's true. Although I think we'll... we'll st- there will be a few things about him. Although, I mean, it's hard to say what is he, about him, what is about his surroundings. But now I think you will you will hear about um, something the more di- directly about him. Yeah, it, mm-hmm. is, it doesn't show him in a good light. I have to say. Oh no! <clears throat> but not a pedophile. So still, no, no. Like, it's the, a plus this, one this, for me. This will continue as you will see. This yeah. uh, not a pedophile <laughs> theme. Um, as a geriatric fetish. Uh, well, no, but, but often yeah, he's, he, a, he's a grave robber, not a cradle robber. I mean, he has uh, lots of like lovers. All of them are grown women, and often they are older than him. So word, ah, doing a background there. Yeah. So Class. <clears throat> when Imperium was published, Yoki traveled to Europe to promote it, and it, it didn't always go that great. Um, <laughs> no. Yeah, so, for example, <laughs> in Belgium in 1949. He was supposed to promote this book, so he met two. He uh, had some contact with two obscure right-wing journalists. Um, so the way they organized this book promotion was that they met in some house. It was Yoki, the two obscure journalists. Uh, then they called like some uh, Flemish painter who had some vague European ideas. So they thought, okay, maybe he will get along with Yoki. <laughs> and then there was this guy uh, believes Europe exists. You're gonna love Yaki. Come on. Yeah. So there was also um, a Flemish choreographer called Elsa Devette or Devet. I don't know. Uh, uh, she was 46 years old at the time. Uh, she became Yaki's new lover. Uh, mm. She was 14 years older than him. Uh, and there was also her father there who was uh, like some just i guess ordinary guy but who was like a pro nazi during the war and some kind of a collaborationist so this is the whole group of people who was at this promotion 
uh, and it was horrible. I mean, we know this from Elsa's uh, <laughs> account. She wrote to the Ke- Kevin Coogan about it. She said it. Uh, she saw it, it as a miserable and grotesque uh, thing. <laughs> um, <clears throat> they mostly didn't speak uh, each other languages. Um, no one knew really what Imperium was about and didn't understand it. Fair. Uh, Yoki was mad and kind of uh, sh- uh, he climbed up uh, in this. He was supposed to, uh, you know, present the book, but he didn't feel like talking, and he was kind of angry at the whole situation. He pouted. Uh, oh, yes. his book thing. Yeah, he had a pout. So at some it's point, my party. but he obviously liked El- Elsa, uh, who, who I, I, as I said, she's a, was a choreographer. I think quite quite well known. Like there is a, like I think a Wikipedia page about her and so on. But she was also apparently a fascist. Um, and uh, so uh, at some point, he kind of stood up, Yoki, and uh, suggested like to Elsa that they should go out for a walk. And while they were having a walk. He kind of looked miserable and disappointed and ill. And she also told her that he didn't eat properly for two days. So then she decided to, to take him home and uh, 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 like feed him. Aww. And uh, when she, he was fed, he started talking about the Imperium. And oh, he was, he was just hangry, that's all. Yeah, he was he hangry. had the hangries. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he talked and talked and talked now about Imperium, and he was amazed there was like a woman here who could understand what he was saying. So, oh, Jesus. Yeah, that's what she says. A dame who understands uh, yes. <laughs> Imperium. <laughs> so they fell in love and became lovers. Um, it was a very passionate relationship. Uh, Yoki proposed marriage a few times. She uh, said no. Um, be, uh, she saw that as a desperate attempt to uh, prevent separation between them, which was inevitable. Uh, probably also to get some new property. Probably as well. Yeah. Uh, she said that uh, no woman should ever marry a soldier, which is how she saw him as a kind of oh. an ideological soldier dedicated to this uh, struggle. And then she gently explained to him that their relationship was something very exceptional and that they must not lower it to this you know, bourgeois level of marriage and such things. And that this is not for them and that ultimately this, this would destroy their relationship anyway. So he cried and he mm-hmm. was very uh, like uh, <laughs> sad because of this, but he uh, agreed that she, of, of course, is right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Ooh, complicated man, this Yaki. <laughs> yes. Um, she, she also described him as a damn nuisance to go, to, go, to go out with. So he was always creating some kind of conflicts with random people and complained about everything. So, for example, going to a restaurant with him was hell. But the worst incident uh, uh, that she remembers is this one. They were in Belgium in, in a, uh, like in a post office, uh, standing in a line. He, Yoki wanted to buy some stamps. Uh, but it was like very slow and then finally it was his turn and there was some elderly clerk who was very slow in Yoki's opinion so Yoki just started shouting abuse at him Uh, imbecile uh, in a fascist country you would uh, not be allowed to show your (laughs) stupid face here and so on so this is always on yeah, so this kind of uh, really uh, angered the people in the post office, mm. um, and they wanted to intervene. So Elsa, like, she didn't know how, what to do, so she pretended to faint, which uh, created a d- diversion and allowed them to leave the post office. This is like but, a silent film comedy scene. Yes. Yeah, right. So she said they, uh, they, they left, uh, uh, they walked out of slowly, and she said looking quite sheepish. Uh, Francis, uh, bring me my smelling salts. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and the people <laughs> around them were commenting, like, poor woman with this madman, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no wonder she didn't want to marry this asshole. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he also slapped her at, uh, once. Uh, oh, damn. And this happened because she was mad at him because he was tormenting her cats. Oh, my uh, God. It's not explained, like, what he was doing. But he, uh, she slapped him back, and he was really shocked at this, and then quickly apologized. <clears throat> I'm gonna guess cried a little, just a little. I don't know, maybe. Shit hurts. I mean, I I feel this was a relationship with a lot of crying. It seems like that. Seems seems intense. Yes, with the cats and all that. Yeah. In the meantime, in it, uh, in Italy, uh, as I said, Yoki uh, 
really appealed to the so-called radical wing of the MSI. Um, it seems that Yoki uh, visited Italy twice in 49 and 51. Uh, he met the leaders of the neo-fascist party and uh, especially uh, was close to this Princess Pignatelli that we mentioned and she mm. became his fin financier, it seems. So in 51, he was involved with her in organizing a convention in Naples of her like women's section of the, uh, the, the, the MSI. Right. Um, and... The leader of the MSI, as I mentioned, Giorgio Almirante, was the official in the, uh, of the Salo Republic. So Salo Republic, I think mm -hmm. we mentioned this already, people probably know, was the um, kind of resurrected fascist state at the end of the war after Italy really capitulated. Then the hardcore Nazis after uh, Mussolini was liberated by, you know, these like Nazi commandos by led by Otto Scorzeni. They made um, this... A Nazi aligned like Italian uh, fascist state, which was like the puppet of the Third Reich you know, in the north of the Italy, and supposedly somehow ideologically went back to their roots, like which they saw as mm -hmm. kind of socialist, revolution, revolutionary, like anti monarchist fascism. So, <clears throat> Giorgio Almirante was a representative of this kind of uh, trend in, in Italian neo fascism, which you could also see as some kind of a uh, Italian version of Strasserism, for example. And he liked Yoki. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He liked Yoki very much uh -huh. uh, and praised the uh, Imperium. Um, and uh, he was also representative of the MSI's anti-NATO wing. Mm. Um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. So uh, he, uh, Yoki also found uh, supporters in Italy um, in a mo magazine which was called Imperium, uh, uh, coincidentally. Uh, and these were the supporters of Julius Evola uh, there. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, Evola himself wrote uh, in 51 a review of Imperium, which was generally a positive one. Like he liked uh, Yoki's, he agreed with Yoki's view of Europe and its place in the world and so on. But he also thought that Yoki really didn't understand Spengler well enough, which uh, mm. uh, 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 um, uh, led him to some... Uh, too optimistic conclusions about the world, in Evola's opinion. So Evola, of course, at the time was the main ideologue of uh, uh, neo-fascism in Italy, but also of like uh, ne of fascist terrorism from a kind of an uh, uh, we could say nihilist point of view. I think we mentioned this earlier because Evola was really a reactionary who was influenced by a lot of supposedly like Hinduist ideas. Mm. I mean, how really they were, or they were like. Western interpretations of those ideas, but he firmly believed how, you know, we live in Kali Yuga. I, apparently, Joe Rogan tweeted something about Kali yeah, Yuga. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, Evola agreed with Joe Rogan that we live in Kali Yuga, <laughs> and this is the dark age when all the true, you know, values are inverted, and basically you cannot do anything about it. Right. And that you really need to wait it out, and that uh, after the complete crash uh, of the dark age a new golden age will appear but um, and he, Spengler says some things that are uh, along those lines for example he has this uh, Spengler makes this differentiation between a culture and civilization and mm -hmm. civilization is the final stage of culture which is this age of decadence and what Evola thinks is that Yoki doesn't understand it is you you cannot uh, reverse this decline of a civilization. That's very uh, so, fair. Very so very there critique. is no uh, hope of starting some kind of an imperium um, while the civilization is still existing. Um, he also thinks that Yoki confuses the age of Caesar Caesarism with the this coming imperium that he hopes for, because in Spagger's opinion, Caesarism was only the kind of... Um, the last stages of civilization, which is the last stage of, of culture, and it is not a good basis for uh, starting a new kind of traditional empire. Yeah, it's mm. it's almost the whole point. Yes. Really. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this probably, I mean, Yoki was aware of Evola, and they published some text and praised him in their uh, publication, Front Fighter. So he probably didn't take this criticism well. We know that he didn't like to be criticized uh, from some French fascist who met Yoki at the time and said that Yoki 
did not allow a, uh, any criticism of his ideas, that he was convinced that he's a repository of an absolute uh, undebatable truth, um, mm. and that the methods that he thought to be, uh, uh, and that the methods that he thought should be used uh, do not uh, allow any kind of discussion uh, about any anything that he promoted. Uh-huh. Um, this episode, like constantly, Yoki is going uh, uh, to Europe and then back to the US and then back to Europe and so on. So mm-hmm. in early 1950, Yoki returned to the U- US and he was hoping to find uh, political and financial support for his organization ELF. And he was hoping to find this support in the Christian Nationalist Crusade. So he met um, the Duchess of mm-hmm. Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> So the Christian Nationalist Crusade was a far-right organization led by Gerald L.K. Smith, who we mentioned a few times already. Yeah, in the Coughlin episode, I think. Yeah. yeah, so this is the largest far-right group in America of the time. Uh, Smith was connected to, as Fritz said, to uh, Father Coughlin, to Henry Ford, to America yeah. First Party yeah. and America First Committee, yeah. and so on. And Yogi had a quite a good and close oh, connection also, with uh, he was found... A f- incredibly important influence in starting Christian identity or making it a widespread movement as well yeah. by bringing mm-hmm. uh, Wesley Swift around everywhere. So Yoki had a, like a close connection with them and he visited the national headquarters of uh, CNC in St. Louis. Uh, but his main contact with the group was a guy called uh, Don Lobeck, who was a classical pianist as well um, mm-hmm. and a former member of the American First Committee before the war. Um, and they actually, uh, while uh, uh, Yoki was in America now, on this uh, um, trip back, they actually lived together. So he lived with him in Lobeck's flat d- mm. during 1950. He had a lot of interesting roommates in his life. Yes. Yeah, right. Mm. So um, he gave a series of talks uh, organized by the group CNC, mostly criticizing the Nuremberg trial. That was kind of the point of this series of talks. Um, and CNC, the Christian National Crusade, had a, a national convention uh, in July of 1950 in LA, and it seems that Yoki was one of uh, like featured speakers at the convention. Hmm. Um, but uh, soon after that, he had a uh, he cut his relations ties with the uh, Smith, the leader of the organization. Uh, we don't know. Exactly why did Smith maybe uh, decided that Yoki is maybe too extreme for him or too much of a pro-Soviet for a cre- organization which is called the Christian National Crusade? <laughs> yeah, that's um, uh, but uh, we know that Yoki considered Smith to be like a, a scam artist, a financial opportunist, and his organization a, a kind of a racket. So yeah. he didn't. All fair. He didn't like that. Um, but uh, he tried to recruit uh, uh, Lobeck, uh, uh, his roommate, uh, into his group, like he did with these um, uh, collaborators of Mosley. But he was mm-hmm. not so successful. Lobeck, Lobeck was like completely shocked by what Yoki uh, was saying to him when he tried to recruit him and became convinced that Yoki was some kind of a communist. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine that, you know, if you look, if you're a far right American dude in period of time and then like early 1950s yes and there's some fucking fancy pants nazi that just came from europe probably with a invented accent suddenly yeah who's telling you to like you know how he needs all this support for this like european group that supports the soviets that you would probably be pretty skeptical of that yes i mean that pretty much goes against i mean it goes against a lot of like far right tendencies of the time, but I think especially in America. Yes, oh, I don't yeah. think there's a single like pro Soviet like oriented. I mean, especially uh, like an group. activist of a group which is called the Christian Nationalist Crusade. I mean, like yes. probably the worst thing yeah. you can tell them. Yeah, you know what we should do? We should support the Soviet Union. I mean, that's yes. like so he was completely shocked and he uh, asked him to move out. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of their relationship. So, uh, having failed to gain any uh, support, really, in America for his organization, Yoki immediately started uh, um, planning how to return to Europe. So, what he did, uh, he applied for a job with the American Red Cross, um, and he made sure that they know that he will only accept a job if they send him to Europe. Like, mm-hmm. um, Yeah, so, they all say that, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> so... He was sent uh, for some training for uh, Red Cross. And as we know, like, because all of these people I later talked to at the FBI and other, like, um, police uh, organizations, 
Like they all knew that he was a Nazi because he was talking nonstop about being a Nazi and <laughs> how he only wants this job so he could go to Europe and doesn't really is not really interested in, in, in any uh, other way and so on. Um, he often expressed hatred against Jews and black people and also praised the way in which um, uh, the Germans exterminated the Jews during the war. The, all this while training for the Red Cross. <laughs> a lot of red flags there. Of course, yeah. he got the job and was sent to Germany. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Right to Germany. Perfect. Yes. Um, so while uh, in Germany, he was supposed to work for the Red Cross and was be being paid by them, but he used all of his time that he was supposed to work to visit Nazi friends and his girlfriend and so on. Sounds um, like him. Damn, was, that, was this like easy as fuck to do back in the day? People would just like get sent to Europe, fuck off and like not do anything, still get paid for it for a while until they're like, oh, shit. His life is a He's permanent year anything. abroad. He's just Seems like a grad school student. It was easy for student. him, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. This was a report, I think, uh, from a Red Cross, uh, like some superior of Yoki's. Or, no, I think this is like, a, maybe this is some information from an informant, but it's about his work. Uh, Whoever it was, they're superior to Yoki, for sure. This was like about his work uh, for the Red Cross in Germany. Um, so... Subject had no apparent respect for authority of any kind in the two-week period at Baumholder. He succeeded in making enemies with all persons in authority. Subject was openly very poor German, and his entire attitude seemed to be against the government of the United States. Um, <laughs> Recommend for promotion. On several <laughs> occasions, Subject reportedly stated that he had come overseas on the Red Cross steamship line, which is how he called uh, the Red Cross, and it was apparent that he had used the Red Cross only as a method of getting back to Germany. Subject had no interest in his work and would not even maintain office hours. He tried to take advantage of every possible loophole to, he discovered and made a statement that he had traded Red Cross supplies for free meals at one of the army ma masses. That's that noble spirit he's talking about. Yeah. That but hard I mean, to ethic. be fair, he, he was pretty clear about this from the very beginning, before he got the job. Yes, yes. I mean, more or less. I the mean, idiots for fucking hiring him. He, he, <laughs> he, he went to training and said, I'm a Nazi, I hate the Jews, uh, and I am only getting this job to go to Germany. And they, they said, and okay, they said, fine. Yeah, okay. Yes. And then, what, a surprise that he gets to Germany yeah. and doesn't want to work for the Red Cross. So, he, uh, during that time, he stayed in some hotel... And um, his room and board was paid by the Red Cross. And it's, it is reported that every night he seemed to have another prostitute in his room. Um, and the Red Cross director, Robert Schouten, first thought uh, that Yoki was slightly queer. But then when hmm. he saw all of this going on, he changed his mind. <laughs> um, yeah. He could still be slightly queer, you know. I guess. It's all good. <laughs> um. Ooh. So, um, let me see. So, at the time, he was investigated by like a few American intelligence agencies, and a lot of informants were saying things about him. And he kind of figured out that this is going on, so he just left for Italy. Um, and there, he met an interesting guy. Apparently, when he left to Italy, there was already a guy there who was looking for him. An Italian guy who spent the whole of 1951, this is now 1952, looking throughout Europe for Yoki. Uh, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, an Italian guy called Egidio Boschi. So Boschi was uh, an old, like, old time, like, fascist veter veteran. He was involved in the March on Rome in 1922. And then okay. in, uh, Boschi in 1927 moved to Chile and became involved in the fascist movement there. Oh, wow. um, so while he was there, he also became uh, some kind of an artist. So he had like this kind of, um, a, I guess, a gimmick or something like this. He would make, this is like pretty incredible, he would um, uh, paint uh, artworks, like these were like apparently detailed uh, portraits and landscapes and so on, but he would do this uh, using a microscope and he would paint them on the um, heads of pins. Okay. Um, so and it's he, a gimmick. Yeah. Uh, apparently, he almost went blind in this process. Um, so he. So this guy's good and crazy then. 
Yes. Mm. So he read Imperium and uh, liked it, and he wanted to meet Yoki, and finally he did meet him in Italy in 1952. And so they made some <laughs> And murdered of... him. <laughs> no. Uh, they made some kind of an agreement, and uh, basically what happened was that Yoki agreed to become this guy's business manager. That that's, was a part okay. of their agreement. Uh-huh. <laughs> so then they left Italy separately. And the then... customary 45% will do. Yeah. <laughs> they left Italy separately, and then they met in Montreal, in Canada. Um, Bosky arranged some exhibition of his pins there, apparently. But they also... <laughs> what uh, does that look like? I don't know. Like, how do you do an exhibition? <laughs> like, it's like a cushion. It's like a little pillow on a table. It's all yes. right there. You're done. Yeah. I guess we just have to view it with a microscope, presumably. Yes, you yeah. have to look at it with a microscope. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So uh, while Now, trust they're... me, it's there. It's there. <laughs> Uh, while they're uh, there, they also met uh, like a Canadian Nazi leader there called uh, Adrian Arcand and made some agreements with them. They were like in the process of starting a new fascist magazine in Canada, I think. Um, but uh, I think also they were kind of monitored by uh, Canadian police because there is also like some report by an informer in Canada who overheard a conversation between these two guys. And during the conversation, they both bragged the Italian guy and Yoki, how they both um, did stuff for the Third Reich during the Second World War and, like, uh, kind of helped uh, the Nazi side, did some sabotage and stuff like that. Great. Um, they also, in this conversation, casually said how they were both members of a secret fascist organization mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. they are willing to work for the Russians, but mm. no way they would work for the US or the UK. Ah, good. So some high treason. Yes. So wait, this is the secret Nazi organization with millions of members and a secret Führer? I, maybe. I don't know. That's mm. This is now a, a different report not connected to that one that mm. also mentions a secret Nazi organization. Um, <clears throat> but uh, because, you know, the Canadians uh, got this information, they informed uh, the Americans. So these two guys were supposed to go to America, but this became a problem because now... Uh, Bosky couldn't get a, a visa because it was reported that he's a member of a secret fascist organization. So uh, uh, Yoki got frustrated and he went to New York City without the Italian guy. Um, and this is where he met um, some people that I think we mentioned briefly before. Uh, uh, this was H. Keith Thompson and Fred Weiss. I will also, again, explain who they are and why this is important. But uh, just say that this basically... This was the end of the partnership between uh, Bosky and uh, and Yoki. But uh, before uh, they uh, separated, Yoki took six pins from Bosky and took it with himself as, <laughs> I guess, some kind of payment for his managerial services. I don't know. Um, so when he arrived to uh, New York City, um, uh, Yoki started working for his new uh, friend, H. Keith Thompson, uh, who was a member or part of this kind of... Um, more sophisticated New York Nazi scene that we mentioned before. I will also talk more now about them. Uh, mm -hmm. He was also, uh, Ke Thompson was a friend of uh, Matt um, Kale, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some photos of them together from this. So uh, he, liked, he liked really boring people. They were like poets and uh, so on. They were like uh, admirers of Ezra Pound who knew mm -hmm. him and uh, such things. Also connected to Nazi intelligence. Okay. Um, so he started doing some work for Thompson, and this was mo mostly doing some legal uh, research in Washington, D.C., because Thompson was also a part of this effort to support Nazi war criminals. And for these purposes, he was doing some work, uh, Yoki, for Thompson in, in Washington, D.C. Um, and also he helped uh, H.K. Thompson uh, to become a legal representative uh, of the Socialist Reich Party in the United States, hmm. which he, he became a regi registered agent for the Socialist Strike Party. Interesting. So uh, while doing this work uh, for Thompson in 52, Yoki moved into a house which was near Washington of his friends, which was a couple called Warren and Virginia Johnson. Warren was apparently some psych psychiatrist or something like this. Um, he knew them since 1947 and stayed for two months there. And then he left in May of 1952, but he took Virginia with himself because they were lovers, uh, nice. which Warren found out <laughs> after they moved out. Um, Oops, damn. As he found some letters that they were exchanging letters for years while he was living in Europe and so on. 
and the FBI said that the letters were of obscene nature. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> yes. Um, Damn. So Warren, is Warren Johnson was very dirty. pissed, you know, and Cut that dude. he started <laughs> talking with the FBI um, and about Yoki, and he found uh, some letters of Yoki that he gave to the uh, FBI. One of them uh, 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 was where a letter in which Yoki described he uh, how he got a job uh, to write in 1952 to write a speech for Senator Joseph McCarthy, which is oh, interesting. Wow. Oh, yeah. Yes. So um, they also discovered uh, the manuscript of the speech. And uh, in it, uh, uh, it is uh, like, so the McCar- uh, uh, Senator McCarthy was supposed to uh, com- uh, like talk to criticize Washington's demands uh, for Germany's unconditional surrender. Um, and contrast this with the attempts to negotiate with the communists in Korea and so on, and mm. say how this is unfair. Um, so uh, uh, the former Mosley associate, who then became one of the founders of the European Liberation Front, John Gannon, uh, says that um, Yoki and McCarthy had been in contact much before 1952. Um, which is not wow. something that uh, Coogan could verify independently. But apparently, wow. according to this guy, um, McCarthy was also involved in the work uh, to free some Nazi war criminals and also visited Germany for this purpose. Um, interesting. Very interesting, yeah. And at the time when uh, Yoki was writing this speech for McCarthy, McCarthy was, it was planned for him to give a speech about the strengthening of the relationship between Germany and the U.S. And this was uh, this speech was organized by the German-American Waters Alliance, which was the successor organization to the Bund. To the Bund, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, and the and this uh, event was organized by H. Keith Thompson, and hmm. uh, together with the McCarthy, with Senator McCarthy, uh, other speakers there were supposed to be some Holocaust deniers and pro-fascists. Hmm. Hmm. Damn. Then there was some negative publicity, and and, and McCarthy canceled his uh, participation in this event. Um, Crazy. Yeah. I no idea about that. It's interesting, yeah. too, that, uh, you know, there's been a lot of kind of fascists on this arc who have said very nice things about McCarthy, saying, yeah. like, hey, we're his people, mm-hmm. we're fighting his war. I thought they were being metaphorical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe not. But it also shows you, you know, so this is like some supposedly pro Soviet guy, but then he writes speeches for McCarthy in which he attacks the USA for collaborating with communists and so on. I mean, yeah, but Asian communists. Yeah. You know. uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, so Yoki left Washington in May of, uh, 1952 in like in haste when, uh, Warren found out about the relationship he had with Virginia. Uh, so together with Virginia, they went to Atlantic city. Uh, so, and during May and June of 1952, um, Yoki tried to exhibit, uh, uh the pins he took from Bosky uh-huh. on, the, on yes. the boardwalk there. Yeah. Um, and uh, get some. He tried money. to exhibit his stolen property. Yes. yes, but the FBI says that he never managed to get uh, more than a few dollars per day. No shit. Yeah, this was not a popular <laughs> thing, it seems. Um, hmm. So Warren was kind of in search for them, uh, Warren Johnson, and he heard that they were in Atlantic City, so he went there to confront them. But they already were gone, so he didn't manage to find them there. Apparently, at the time, Virginia visited her aunt and uncle. Uh, probably to ask for money. And then she explained how Yoki is doing very confi- important confidential political work okay. and how mm. meeting him completely changed her and her views of politics and life and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Europe, Sounds like he's uh, gotten quite good at this grift of yes. his at this point. Yeah. Uh, so H.K. Uh, Thompson uh, took in um, uh, Yoki and placed him in his parents' apartment in New Jersey. Uh, but Yoki also stayed in Thompson's apartment in Manhattan. Um, mm. This is when the period when uh, Thompson and Yoki and also Fred Weiss became very good friends. Fred Weiss also had a farm near um, uh, New York City, which was a kind of a place where fascists would meet, and he, Yoki also lived there for uh, some time. This is also where Mad Kale would hang out. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I wonder Tom- if that's up by the um, by the old. Um- What's it called? Uh, the old compound up there, the Bundwan. Yeah, that the, that was apparently some other guy's farm. Well, they but... had like the Hit, Hitler Street and stuff. Yeah, was H. Key Thompson 
the one that uh tried to get the Seven Up franchise and all that shit? No, no, that's um, uh, that's the um, was it D D West Hooker? D yeah, West D. Hooker. West. Okay, sorry. But uh, <laughs> they also had the connection. Though, these two guys. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And they both frequently wrote to at the FBI. Although um, H. K. Thompson apparently it is he claimed, and other people who I guess like him claimed that he was always like giving false information to the FBI. Uh, I mean. But who knows? I mean, he was also like very anti-American. Like this is mm-hmm. what connected uh, him and Yoki. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so they, during this time, Thompson and Yoki became like very good friends. They um, they would uh, walk the beaches of New Jersey Shore. They would swim at three a.m. three a.m. in the morning. They would watch the sunrise over the Atlantic and discuss great men such as Hitler. Mussolini, William II, Himmler, um, Franco, and so on. Aww. I like long walks on the beach, yes. discussions Aww. about Hitler, <laughs> Himmler, uh, playing the piano. Uh, <clears throat> Yoki spent uh, the fall and uh, winter of 1952 living clandestinely in New York City, trying to find uh, a, a way to get back to Europe. Um, but without any detection from the U.S. government, because they were searching for him. So this is mm. a problem, how to travel to Europe without the American government knowing that you're doing this. So he asked Fred Weiss and H.K. Uh, Thompson for help. Uh, they had connections in the international Nazi movement, for example, with this Der Weg group in, and their network in uh, Argentina and so on. So Fred Weiss was actually a German guy who was older than them. He was born in 1866. And he, mm. he first came to America in 1910, then went back. Uh, to Germany to fight in the First World War and came back to the U.S. in 1930. He became involved in the est- like real estate market in uh, New York and also in right-wing circles before the war and also after the Second World War. So, damn, this guy was pretty old at this point then. Yes. Um, yeah, Jesus. So he was like also like Yoki, like very into Spangler, an anti-Semite, mm-hmm. of course. He also, you know, saw Russia as this uh, Asiatic power, uh, which is kind of escaped the, uh, Jewish control. He made this distinction between Trotskyism, kind of a Western Jewish communism, which is subversive to European values, and then Stalinism as this Eurasian um, uh, communism, which is somehow anti-Jewish and so on. And he really was pro this alliance of Russian strength in power with the German technological genius, as Weiss saw mm. it. Uh, mm. And for this reason, many at the time believed that he actually worked for the Communist Party. Uh, he played a, a crucial role in the creation and, and financing of the National Renaissance Party, wow. which is this um, yeah. where the neo-Nazi group started uh, after the war in New York. Um, and it is said that he was the real power behind this group. Hmm. Okay. Um, so H. K. Thompson, his good friend, was 32 at the time. He was three years younger than Yoki. Uh, he was a Yale graduate, uh, graduate, and he was a former U.S. naval officer. He was also apparently, like, I think, kicked out of the Navy because of being gay. I think or something like this. Hmm. I think there, this is mentioned in his FBI files. He uh, joined um, the Bund in New York as a teenager. Um, and, uh, so now this, he's, he claims this, and uh, I mean, there's maybe some evidence to support this, but he claimed that as a teenager, he, uh, maintained a correspondence with Kaiser Wilhelm II, um, wow. and became friends with Karl II, King of Romania, and also hmm. the Prince August Wilhelm of Prussia, who was a member of the SA. Well, I guess hmm. there's no way to verify that, is there? Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, through this Prince August, uh, a Nazi, uh, supposedly he got a signed portrait of Hitler in the, the 1930s, uh, which he like had on his desk until the US. Yeah, but it made him a, a big, yeah. very popular among the Bundists. Yeah, 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 exactly. And this um, is just what he said whenever he introduced himself to somebody, I guess. Probably. By the way, I have a signed portrait of Hitler. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. So he was also a, a close friend and collaborator to a guy that we also mentioned before, who was an important member of this New York circle of fascists, which is George Sylvester Vierek. I think Fritz oh, also yeah. mentioned him. He's an old yeah, favorite. Yeah. Also like a Jer- German who moved to America and was a poet, a novelist, uh, also a friend of Ezra Pound. Big and, socialite. 
and a German agent uh, during World War One and World War Two, uh, and he coordinated the German propaganda and lobbying network in the United States. Um, so Thompson was active in the Navy from 1942 to 1948, um, and then he returned to New York City and was involved in various businesses there. Um, so he he kind of because uh, Kevin Coogan while writing this book was in communication with him, so. Uh, Thompson would sometimes um, tell him stuff in these letters that implied that he was like involved in Nazi sabotage of um, U.S. Navy uh, during the war. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. We are always okay. This is maybe I can read something and then if it's too much, you can just cut what you want. I'm not going to cut your German, please. It's not German. Oh, this is the American who. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so give me your you give me your best American. <laughs> oh, so oh, actually, I'm not going to read it. That is a very good American ah, impression. No, no, I am going to read. So, okay. um, so he sent this to uh, Coogan in 1995. This is H. K. Thompson writing in 1995. My file burning is proceeding well. Could be <laughs> you you'd be amused to know that I burned this week this week blueprints, deck and cargo plans, and related materials pertaining to SS Normandy. They were yellowed, brittle, and disintegrated. Uh, disintegrated. Disintegrated. And diseg no, it's um, infinitive. Disintegrating. Disintegrating. They were yellowed, brittle, and disegregated. I cannot say Desegregation. <laughs> the Yellow, brittle, disintegrating. They were yellowed, brittle, and disintegrated. Almost. <laughs> Fuck it, we'll do it live! So I'm just going to skip this sentence. <laughs> um... <laughs> But such old memories. At my age, only memories are left. So basically, he's saying how um, this was like a famous case of this, uh, like um, a, a, uh, an American ship, I think, which was destroyed in '42. So he's implying that he had something to do with it. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. Okay. And that he's now destroying evidence in 1995. Is, is this credible? It's. I mean, it's so fantastical, you know, um, the stuff that he's. People say that this guy did a lie a lot, and he was uh -huh. kind of. I mean, that he prouded himself as some thing like false information to the FBI to everyone. So it's hard to say, you know. Mm -hmm. But also, people with him, they choose to uh, believe what suits them and not believe what doesn't. Like, for example, some right. mm -hmm. some Nazis today say how because uh, how he lied about this. Um, circle uh, in the 1950s of fascists in uh, New York City because he also said how it involved Jews and like gay people and how they were into orgies and so on. So Nazis were like, do they say like, oh, no, that's obviously he, he lied about that. I, so, mean, I mean, we you know, know though <laughs> yeah. that at least some of that is true. Yeah. So if we're talking about national states rights, I'm sorry, uh, National Renaissance Party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, Thompson took a more visible political role in the early 1950s. This is when he became the representative of the Socialist Strikers Party in, in, in America. And he was also like a, a correspondent with their Vague magazine in uh, uh, Argentina and was the literally agent for Hans Ulrich Rudel, who we mentioned before, the Luftwaffe mm -hmm. guy uh, who published a book in America and so on. Um, so in September of 1952, Yoki and Virginia checked into a hotel in New York City and uh, at the time, Thompson introduced them to Vierek. Vierek apparently called Yoki the, the orange boy. This was because of his mm -hmm. um, his pseudonym, uh, which he used to write Imperium, which is Varange or Varange. Ah. I don't know how it's... Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, so at the time, they were all hanging out in, in, you know, in Vierek's flat, which was a kind of a salon for all of these... Um, Probably a swinging fucking pad, honestly. Yes. Uh, so Vierek was apparently like uh, openly bisexual... Uh, hmm. uh, uh, friends with Kinsey, the the, the sexologist, uh, yeah. very enthusiastic about orgies, sex research, and so on. Yeah. Uh, so they would talk about books, there, politics, the literary scene, and so on. Uh, apparently, Vierek was also friends with another sexologist, which was called Harry Benjamin, who was a German Jew uh, hmm. and uh, all influenced, like interested in all kinds of. Stuff uh, regarding, you know, this, like, s apparently, like, the sex research they were involved with. Uh, so, like, uh, also prostitution. And uh, because Virginia became his assistant, there were rumors that he that she was, like, a sex worker uh, at the time. Hmm. Um, uh, probably unfounded. Uh, 
but but uh, it is interesting that um, Yoki was saying how Virginia is his sister to uh, everyone because, like, I oh, guess they were weird. trying That's to weird at all. conceal who they are. So, but you know, everyone knew that something was going on. So it is said that this Harry Benjamin talked to Kinsey about Virginia's incestuous relationship with her brother. <laughs> uh, nice. I guess he was very interested in that, but he probably liked uh-huh. that, you know, Yoki was saying that she, uh, that made it interesting, I guess, for them. I didn't see the Nazi connection in that uh, show, Masters of Sex. Did you guys see that? The... No. 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 Well, it I know of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is the sequel, Master Race of Sex. Yeah. <laughs> so Yoki, at the time, also became involved with Hazel Guggenheim McKinley, she was a member of the famous Guggenheim, Guggenheim family. a very rich pers- family, very rich person. Uh, she was friends with uh, Thompson, and then she asked him to introduce her to young fascist men. And um, <laughs> she was interested. She's one of these Dior types. Yes. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. And then Yoki, and uh, she became lovers, of course. Um, Yoki wasn't exactly young at this point, though, right? I mean, he's no. probably pushing... F- yeah. yeah, he's in his prime, forty or something. Yeah, I guess so. I guess thirty-five, <laughs> something like this. I don't know. Um, so um, uh, Yoki was also into like uh, sadomasochism. Apparently, um, I uh, think maybe we'll mention more. Well, there is not much to mention. He wrote some like SM porn, I guess, uh, right. which, which was published. Fish Reading Club. I know. <laughs> yeah, what Yo, we got definitely. on the docket. And this was published. Uh, and apparently, this relationship that he had with this Guggenheim person also involved some of the S and M stuff. Um, and um, apparently, he liked to whip girls. This was his thing. Uh-huh. Um, Maybe we can skip that book. Yeah, I don't know. I don't... <laughs> <laughs> so uh, at the time when this was going on, something happened in the uh, Czechoslovakia that Yoki really kind of, I guess, liked. And this is that the fourteen leading Czech communists. Uh, were arrested 11 were jews out of them and they were tried convicted and then executed i think in prague in a short trial uh, for being spies for zionist organizations freemasons cia mi6 and so on but it, mm-hmm. it's, oh. they were uh, like very openly accused of being zionist and freemasons and so on so they right. they were like very important communists in czechoslovakia one there was like a general secretary of the communist party the foreign minister of Czechoslovakia and was among them and so on. So Yoki saw this as a defining political moment and uh, like confirmation of his views that, you know, Russians are moving into an um, overtly communist form of anti-Semitism, which he liked a lot. Um, and not only that, but Thompson later claimed that Yoki told him that he even did some intelligence work for the Checks. So mm. in 1950, uh, he told Thompson apparently that he had some uh, a paid job as a courier for the Czechoslovakian intelligence. Mm. Um, so Yoki, Yoki wrote a, an article about this whole issue. Uh, it was published anonymously in 1952, at the end of 1952, in the Bulletin of the National Renaissance Party, also in the Front Fighter, the the organ uh, of the uh, European Liberation Front, and then translated to Germany and published in the Reveg in Argentina. Uh, in, basically, in the text, he claims that this is a signal to Europe's uh, fascist elite to move away from the U.S. influence and to resist the anti-European plans of American Jewry, and that they should play on the Russian card, card from now on. In January 1953, uh, uh, and I'm now uh, uh, like this is basically now the end of the episode. Uh, in 53, Yoki managed to safely return to Europe, of course. Hmm. Um, and he did that with the forged passport. Um, so he did that, that, that did that in January '53. Of course, um, he abandoned Virginia, who was hospitalized during January when Damn. he left, and she um, was hospitalized because she had an illegal abortion that uh, resulted in severe complications. Fuck! Damn. Yeah. Poor Virginia, man. Yes. Um, so uh, after that. Thompson, like he concocted like a draft of uh, a few pages from uh, some kind of made up memoir. This is what Thompson. Mm-hmm. So this is guy who does things like this. So who knows what is true? Right. Uh, he did that um, uh, to uh, like supposedly expose communist infiltration of the U.S. Uh, right. Uh, and the idea was to present how he was, you know, duped by Yoki. Um, and was not aware of his communist connections and so on. Um, 
and uh, because the FBI was now also really interested in what his connection to all of this. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fred Weiss and him apparently agreed to fake some kind of a um, fight between them, and they deliberately start, started spreading rumors that they were now bitter enemies, Fred Weiss and Thompson. Mm -hmm. uh, so ADL, for example, e e uh, even picked up a report that Weiss and Virginia Johnson paid a gangster to beat up Thompson because he knew too much about Yoki. Uh, <laughs> apparently this was all fake. They were all friends, apparently, but I don't know. Um, that's at least what Thompson later claimed. Um, Thompson... As now, how, how Yoki got his fake passport to go to Europe is that Thompson was a partner in his, uh, with his father in a, like a printing company. And mm. he said how he used that to create documents for fugitive war criminals because he could get all the needed material and he was very skilled at that, apparently. Mm. Uh, and he claimed that he did that for many years, uh, never for money, just for political reasons. And this is the way how he helped Yoki go to Europe. Yeah. Um, by the way, Thompson also, there, there was some document which was found that, uh, a German one, that uh, was used as proof that Thompson was uh, recruited to Nazi intelligence, in, in basically admitted to the SS in 1941 and received the rank of a major in the SS while oh, living, wow. you know, in New York. Um, uh -huh. okay. And he, he later, like in the 90s, he confirmed that this is true. Although, I don't know, maybe he just wanted, you know, to post that he was in the SS. Yeah, I yeah, remember. There, there probably would be some evidence of that, right? I mean, he would probably be able to present some evidence of that if that were true. No? Well, there was. I mean, the, it, like this, uh, some Nazi historian from the Institute for Historical Review came up with this document that basically uh -huh. said well, that. Uh -huh. But on the they other hand, they come up hand, with a lot of documents. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, Kevin Coogan says, "Okay, this guy was like forging things like this was yeah, his." Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, maybe he was. I don't know. Um, so uh, York is leaving for Europe again, and this is now uh, the, we are entering the last seven years of his life, and okay. we'll cover that in the next episode. Yeah. All right. It's going to be an eventful seven years, I guess. Huh? Yes, we'll cover all. Yeah, it's an interesting death as well. Mm hmm. Oh, we always like those. Mm. He's got to be interesting deaths the, of Nazis. He's got to be the dumbest fucking Nazi ever. I mean, he he has like a free ride. No. no, hold on. He's got a free ride here. You know, like he's got multiple intelligence agencies like yeah. traveling around with him, and all he's got to do is not be a fucking Bolshevik. You know? Oh, he and I like don't no know. problems. <laughs> yeah, I guess he wants. Well, to... he wasn't. I guess. Yeah, he just yeah. that's that's the side that he thought had a better chance of winning. Yeah. I'm just saying, he gave up his free pass, you know? Mm. Yeah. I think he really hated Americans and was kind of disgusted by them. Yeah, 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 that's clear. So I guess, I don't know, maybe he just wanted to piss them off. I don't know what his motivation was exactly, psychological. But yeah, that's what he did. Well, yeah, he's one of those, uh, yeah, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> never mind. All right, <laughs> and with that... Uh, I guess we'll catch up with our third and final chapter of uh, Yacht Talk. And, um, yeah. 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 And I guess for a Co couple Imperiums, too. Mm -hmm. Good measure. Yeah. And we'll be doing Imperium on, on Fridays. And if you're really good, I guess Yacht Talk slash fiction. And... If we can find it. <laughs> yeah. If we can find his. Um, uh, I'm very curious. Yeah. Out, 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 out <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean. Uh, my guess is that, like, when the FBI said that these, like, those letters that he had been exchanging had been of obscene nature, mm -hmm. I think it wasn't just like you know, no, nah. they're probably writing some shit in there. That, yeah, yeah, there was like that a FBI involved. agent was like, a, mm -hmm. you know, that the the memes of like the FBI agents like reading people's like some Mormon and guy. Shit. Yeah. yeah, he's got a log uh, as many times as he said <laughs> saddle, just in case it's code for something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, great. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, well so uh, see you soon. Yeah. yeah. All right, guys. Later. Bye. Bye.